for me, the most amazing thing about mollusks is, is I suppose, their, their sheer beauty. The diversity on a simple theme of spiral growth, how much you can do with a simple theme like spiral growth. They show all these wonderful variations. It's kind of like listening to Bach all your life. Blind since childhood, Gary Vermeer has been able to decipher millions of years of history with his fingertips. His fascination with shells began at the age of nine in a moment of wonder. I was first shown some shells from Florida by my fourth grade teacher. I was overwhelmed with their, their beauty. You know, they had uh, such smooth interiors and such rather nicely sculptured and shaped exteriors. The contrasts were beautiful. The ribbing was even, and the whole thing just struck me as a, as a real work of art. And I never turned back. I mean, that was, uh, for me, the, <laughs> the beginning of a career, really. Hi, Gary. Hi. How are you? Oh, fine. Um, I have the uh, Ferrari. Oh, good. Like a detective, Vermeer searches for clues to the stories hidden in shells. His work has revealed the life and death struggles these animals face. To Vermeer, the shell collection at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco amounts to a rich archive of mollusk defensive strategies as they have evolved over millions of years. Let's see here. Well, this is a wonderful mitra mitra. Interestingly, in this very narrow opening are folds that constrict the opening even more. And the shell is also very thick, so that you need a, a great deal of force as a predator to, to break this. Uh, let's see, yeah, why don't we look at some of these. These are, this is a fantastic, uh, <laughs> fantastic species of Muricanthus. This is body armor. These are branched spines that make this shell larger and sturdier. This is the largest living snail today called Syrinx arowanus, and it does it by sheer size. On the sea floor, a thin shell offers little defense against a powerful shell breaker. When attacked by a crab, a caleostoma withdraws far inside its spiral shell. But its brittle shield can't withstand the crunch of powerful claws. One thing that I learned very early on is that no design in biology is ever perfect. And so there will be shells that are not up to the challenge, and there will be shells that are. The first time I ever observed a repaired break, of course, I had no idea what it was. I just thought it was a blemished shell, and I hated it. And it was years later that I finally began to appreciate that repaired breaks actually could tell you something. These are battle scars. Mollusks and humans face very different kinds of battles. But Vermeer realized when he examined the work of military engineers in World War II that our strategies for weapon design are surprisingly similar.
The engineers who were designing fighters and wondering how to improve them examined fighters that came back as opposed to the fighters that didn't. They wanted to know which parts of the plane they had to reinforce. And so they looked at those parts that had flak damage. And those parts, because they worked, didn't need to be reinforced. Instead of protecting the entire shell or the entire airplane, you have to emphasize those parts most vulnerable to the occupant. If a plane could take some hits and keep going, it didn't need strengthening everywhere, only where a direct hit could be fatal. Remarkably, the practical solutions of World War II are strikingly similar to those found in a tide pool. In the war waged here, nature has engineered a simple but effective shell for a mollusk called the leafy hornmouth. The leafy hornmouth has developed just three well-placed ridges along its shell. These ridges add just enough thickness to foil a crab's attempt to get a shell-breaking grip. In the endless variety of shells, Gary Vermeer has found tough survivors, mollusks that have fashioned ingenious solutions to the survival game. <laughs>